Knuckles Comic Issue 10 A fair gets a prophecy about a guardian becoming awesome that's so vague that I'd be amazed if he could get any sort of meaning out of it. I'm not comfortable with the guy calling him Brother Affair, because that makes me think he's like a member of a clergy in a Sonic comic. And also, I thought there was a loner who worked alone with the Ancient Walkers. But now, all of a sudden, he has an echidna friend, and we're expected to just accept that he's always been there. He asks that there if the Ancient Walkers have called him away again because he's been in retreat for longer than usual. Athair warns his tribe that a day of fury is going to come soon and they should all pack up and move on, much to a lady's disappointment at having to keep on with the journey. So he has a whole tribe now? And they're going on a journey to a refuge. Why? They're all on a snowy mountain as well. But we saw Athair in the desert and down under earlier, so was his tribe with him there too, or is this very recent? And Disciple, ugh, I don't like that being referenced in Sonic either. He puts some guy in charge in a council who isn't normally in charge, and says to himself that he feels like a parent watching his child leave the nest. At least he's showing a soft side. After Athera thinks about turning to someone, Knuckles meets up with his mother. He was on his way to Echidna's security team HQ when he saw her go in, and decided to wait for her instead. Aw, that's sweet. That combined with the sad expression of his, makes him seem like a child who's really attached to his mom and waits around for her to finish work. And now I'm thinking of that little girl in Station Square who spent all that time waiting for her dad to come home from work. Considering Knuckles hasn't seen his mother since he was very young, it makes sense that he would regress when it comes to the way he treats her, as he hasn't known her for long enough to naturally progress to treating her like a typical teenager would. After Knuckles' mother says he didn't have to wait outside, Knuckles explains that he just didn't feel comfortable and his mother confirms my assumption about why. He had been raised on a floating island, so he feels like a fish out of water here, even though he's in the kingdom too, which should be even more frustrating for him. Then he says that his father taught him history, math, geography, and science. It seems like his father was pretty well educated and good at homeschooling him, so I'm glad he didn't really miss out. But again, this is certainly a departure from the Knuckles in every other continuity, because I'd never describe Knuckles to be educated. I picture him to be totally uneducated from spending his whole life alone guarding an emerald. But this is Comic Knuckles, so it's an alternate version of him after all. After Lara asks him if he was taught the tones, which I assume would make him even more powerful for learning how to be better at magic, we cut to Constable Remington being an unforgiving jerk to Julie rather than immediately seeing Knuckles' reaction. Julie even points out that she kept Kragok from bailing, but somehow that's not good enough for the constable, even though that should make it blatantly obvious that she doesn't deserve to be treated like this anymore. The constable says that Knuckles doesn't remember much of his recent encounter with Enerjack. Seriously? It'd be, it'd be fine if they at least explained exactly what he doesn't remember, but they don't. At least they try to give an explanation in the text blurb, saying that it's because Knuckles had spent some time with disassociated molecules, but Athera saved him from that fate really quickly, and he didn't show him Nietzsche at the time, so maybe it was a delayed reaction. But again, it, either way, it feels very arbitrary. I really feel sorry for Julie here, and irritated at the constable, who looks like a complete idiot. And then Athera shows up, meeting with Lara, and I like how the two of them are happy to see each other. It's nice to see Athera smiling for once, and being greeted kindly for once. Sure, I didn't like him at first, with him being arrogant and hating technology for no reason, but so many other characters are shown to hate him irrationally that now I just feel sorry for him. I love how Lara actually stands up to Knuckles for being irrationally disrespectful, especially since Athera saved his life when he was being destroyed by Enerjack, and saved the day again in a battle with Mammoth Mogul. That on top of him being buddies with the powerful ancient walkers, and this guy has officially my respect. So I'm pretty happy Lara stands up for him here, saying like a scolding mother, that's no way to talk to your great grandfather. Now I want you to apologize. I like seeing the side to her, showing that she knows how to discipline like a mother, as well as being a nice person. It helps legitimize her being his parent. I also smiled and almost chuckled at seeing Knuckles look really sad and apologize. It's nice to see that for once. And it humanizes Knuckles and makes him more relatable seeing him experience this kind of thing. With that, Athera says it's the time of prophecy and whisks Knuckles away with the ancient walkers. I feel bad that Knuckles didn't get to spend some time with her like he wanted to, but I guess it was a little too soon. We then cut to Constable Remington asking for reports from his secretary. I always really liked the Echidna designs the female ones a lot more than the male ones, because they're better at avoiding the whole they all look like Knuckles problem by looking more feminine, having all sorts of different hairstyles and stuff. 
I like this design. I love Lara Lee's design. Not so much Julie's, though. Anyways, Remington has given a mugshot for someone who's been out of sight since his parole and told to check on him. But then Archimedes shows up asking for Knuckles because he was told he'd been heading to the station. The constable then politely asks Archimedes if he could tell him a thing or two about Julie Sue. I like how polite and amicable they are with each other. And how Archimedes goes angrily, What lady? Defending Julie Sue. Affair tells Knuckles that he's entering the Eastern Hemisphere of the surface of Mobius. I like how deadpan and matter-of-fact he is while saying crazy stuff like this. As if he thinks Knuckles is the weird one for not being used to this. It's kind of amusing. Knuckles asks how that can be when there's echidnas down there, and Ather explains that it was the choice their ancestors made during the time of the coming disaster almost 600 years ago. So good, we're going to know exactly what that tribe was all about. It all started with some ancestors and Knuckles, a scientist couple, Jordan and Kayla La, that last one's kind of a weird name, who had discovered a comet on collision course with Echidna Polis. Okay, no information please, I already know this. At least I know their names now. But I'm just gonna forget them. It turns out that one of Knuckles' ancestors objected to the echidnas having a bitch in Floating Island because the echidnas weren't meant to soar in the clouds. Sounds like philosophical bullshit to me. If anything, them not being meant to is what makes it awesome. Since Arrakis, who probably has a fear of heights, wouldn't accept no for an answer, he asked the council to allow the people who want to follow him of their own free will to do so. This just reminds me of how the council later on wouldn't give the people the choice to keep their technology if they want to. It's like they've become more dictatorial since this point in time, when they're letting everyone who wants to stay in the land to do so. I actually feel pretty sorry for one of the echidnas following him, he looks so depressed. Athera explains the depressing news that this tribe of the echidnas has wandered ever since, looking for a place they can call home. It reminds me of the Selkies in Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. Why can't they just set up a village somewhere? Are they outcasts who aren't allowed to form their own village just about anywhere? Also, they must have been pretty lucky to have miraculously avoided being captured and roboticized with Firebotnik, when even the freaking dragons got that bait. Why aren't all of them roboticized by now? I feel pretty sorry for this tribe, they really should have their own land. But instead, they keep getting booted off any land they try settling because it turned out other people had claimed it. I like how they have a sympathetic justification for it once, with the guy politely saying that we barely have enough food to feed our own kind. And then we see the more unpleasant folks who outright tried to hurt them. But the first one, that's a hunter-gatherer guy. This was 600 years ago, not 600 million. Was this like some sort of indigenous jungle or something? I guess they want to stick with a tribe, so separating from the tribe to just find a home in any random city like normal people wasn't an option. They wanted to find their own land for all of the tribe. Soon we see the cars break down, with the mechanic explaining that there's no spare parts for them to fix them. And because of this, the tribe gives up on technology completely. Because I suppose a wandering tribe wouldn't have easy access to the materials for building and repairing technology in the first place. So this is an actual logical reason for them to give up on technology. They're not really giving it up and shunning it, so much as they feel forced to because they can't maintain it forever outside of civilization. But even then, I hope they're not giving up on it entirely, because that would be really stupid of them. Then after Othair says that they lived a simpler existence, which I rolled my eyes at, the Ancient Walkers arbitrarily chose to come to Arrakis, a mere mortal, and help to look after the tribe. Well, that was nice of them, actually doing something with their powers to help the world for once. But it sure is convenient that they knew about this tribe and where to find it, and knew that the tribe wasn't evil. Then Athair explains that with the Guardians, only those related through blood to the Guardian family could become one, which is not how it's done in the tribe. Because, I guess, well, well then how do they determine who deserves to be the guide then? Do they flip a coin? I mean, you can't really get job training for that sort of thing. Then we cut to the Chaotix eating at a restaurant, which I really like getting to see for once in Sonic. It makes them more relatable and the world more believable. And Vector looks like a cold-hearted jerk, having no sympathy for Julie at all, even after SPO points out that she could have killed him but didn't. You'd think Vector would be more grateful. Charmy then shows up, saying that the constable wants to talk to them right away. And I like how Mighty's all excited, saying, Finally! Something to do! Mighty's reaction to him being playable in Sonic Mania Plus. I like Knuckles interrupting himself from calling a fair by his name to show more respect by calling him his great-grandfather instead. It shows that he's learned an actual lesson from his mother's scolding of him. Then Athera is prevented from finally explaining why he's involved with the tribe when he senses that something's wrong and points it out. 
Somehow, he knows that the Day of Fury is here. At least explain that he's psychic. An earthquake happens as he orders the tribe to take to high grounds and climb away from the random fire coming beneath them. And Knuckles has a hero moment where he saves one of falling into it. Azair insists, despite Knuckles' logic, that there is no safe place because the Day of Fury is nature's way of adjusting to environmental changes and occurs over a certain duration. I'm not really sure what I'm seeing in these panels. Like, guess someone who looks a bit like Sally holding onto something in front of Rotor to prevent herself from getting blown away? And then we see Uncle Chuck talking to Roby in the background as Athair explains that the last time nature arbitrarily had a fuck you moment like this was like 1200 years ago. Knuckles then brings up the fridge logic of how anyone survived the last time rather than it killing off everyone on the planet if it's so bad. Athair then says that most people didn't survive. And as we see the tribe in serious peril, Knuckles complains, oh great. Several hundred echidna is about to be burned to a crisp and you say it's a lost cause. I like that line. It's cathartic to hear. This story by Ken Penders introduces a wandering tribe of echidnas. And I like how they're giving an origin right away that makes sense. It makes sense that some people be wary about moving into permanently living on Phony Island, rather than every single echidna going through with it despite a fear of heights. A third being involved with it makes sense because it's involved with the ancient walkers, who are nice enough to protect the tribe. But the Day of Fury, which I assume is another random magic overflow phenomenon, I don't like it because it feels so arbitrary even then. Just random doom and gloom every so often that killed off most of the planet for no reason. This is almost no better than the Dark Gaia stuff in Unleashed. I also found it annoying how Vector still hasn't gotten a clue that Julie isn't evil yet, even though he acknowledges that she decided not to kill them. Something should have proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Despite a few annoying parts, I did enjoy this story though, that was fully invested in its interesting world building, expanding on a wandering tribe of echidnas that I felt pretty sorry for. And I'm also pretty invested in what will happen to Julie, and hoping that maybe the console will come to his senses about her. 